Hello, thank you all for coming. Um, I thought I'd start my talk off today with a joke or two, because I find that helps cut through the tension and any nervousness I might be feeling. So what did one Zen practitioner give to another for their birthday? Nothing. No. Ah, somebody knows. All right, let's see if you got this one too. A Zen student asked his master, is it okay to use email? Yes, replied the master, but with no attachments. Okay. All right. <laughs> so this talk today will be more of a more of an introduction into who I am, where I come from, how I got here, um, how I first became connected to the Dharma. Um, perhaps if I give a talk in the future, it'll be on a more clearly defined Dharma topic. Um, but for now, if you'll indulge me, this talk will be kind of a little bit different approach in terms of discussing like, again, how I got here, what was my story? Um, I know we all have interesting stories of, of how we encounter the Dharma. It's not, Buddha Dharma is not native to our culture. And so it's, um, we all have interesting stories, I'm sure. Um, um, and mine, we'll see if it's interesting or not. <laughs> um, so just to give a little bit of my background, I grew up uh, in a Christian household. Well, my, my mom was Presbyterian, Presbyterian, and my dad was more like a materialist, more science uh, uh, minded. And um, I definitely was influenced by both. And even to this day, I still have both, um, both sides of those influences on me. I have a very kind of pragmatic, practical side, science minded side. And then obviously being here, uh, a very uh, spiritual side as well. And I, I can definitely trace those influences back to them. Um, but this talk is going to be more, um, the talk is about patterns and rhythm. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about my background as a musician and how that relates to Dharma or how, um, how I sort of see a connect. There's, there's actually a lot of different connections between the two, but this story is more about some experiences I had, um, along the way that that really got me more interested in looking inward as opposed to looking outward. Um, so I actually started playing the trumpet as, as the first instrument in, in, in uh, elementary school, but um, I was more interested in playing drums. So I, you know, begged my mom for several years to, to get me drum lessons or to get me a drum set. Um, and she she held off for quite a while, um, <laughs> but finally relented. Um, in her infinite patience, she put up with my noise for many years, and uh, so I I am eternally grateful to her for that. Um, but I actually started playing, so I started taking lessons at around age eleven, um, and it was by about twelve that I began like performing in bands, playing in festivals. Um, uh, playing in talent shows and parties and things like that. Um, I definitely grew up with more of an influence in terms of musical styles and more heavier styles of music, rock, metal, those kind of things. But I also played in uh, marching band, jazz band, high school concert band, so classical styles, jazz, funk, all kinds of different styles as well. Um, and it was around 16 that I joined a, a semi-professional metal band and began playing clubs throughout the area. Um, some funny stories were I, I was so young that I, I couldn't actually, I wasn't legally allowed to be in some of the 21 or over clubs. So I would have to sit in the parking lot and uh, wait and just until the moment we were supposed to play and someone would come out in the parking lot and grab me and bring me in and <laughs> play and then I'd have to leave the club. So it's kind of... <laughs> Some fun, some funny stories of me just sitting in my pickup truck in the parking lot, waiting to play. Um, and in terms of my education, I actually, I actually didn't go to college at that at that time. Although I did get a degree later, um, because I was just so, like my whole world was just music and and playing drums. That's all I wanted to do, and I didn't at that time really relate academics to that pursuit. I just couldn't quite make the connection at that time between the two. And so, um, you know, my, my parents and people would say, yeah, but you know, you're going to need something to fall back onto. And, and I, 
I, I had the mindset that if I think I'm going to fall back on something, then that means I'm not going to succeed. So I was just, you know, focused on succeeding and that's what I was going to do. And, and that's what I was focused on. Um, and so, and that's why I'm a Buddhist computer programmer today. <laughs> um, <laughs> so at, at age 21, I went to a place, um, I think it was around 20. I went to a place called uh, Musicians Institute in Hollywood, which actually still exists today. Um, and that was kind of where some of the changes started happening and how I perceived uh, music, how I perceived myself, how I perceived learning. Um, but now I'll, I guess I'll take a step back now for a minute to talk a little bit about how we learn drums and rhythm in the West. I know we have at least one musician here, so she's going to probably understand most, if not more than what I'm talking about. Um, but in particular, in, in drums, we learn rudiments and patterns. So, and by the way, just a side note, uh, a few weeks ago, Ellen, she gave a talk on mandalas, and she was talking about mandalas can be thought of as patterns. And I really found that connection very interesting. It's not something I thought about before. So I won't try to make that bridge too strongly here, but I, I did find that a really interesting connection. Um, but anyway, back to learning the drums. So with, with the drum set in particular, you learn simple kind of hand and feet patterns. You'll learn them s slowly, like they can be very simple. They're, they're usually, they're, they're very linear patterns. So, you know, like, you know, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, things like that, where you're learning to put these patterns together. And once you learn a sufficient number of those patterns, like a puzzle, you can put them together to then make you know pieces of music um but rhythm as i learned it growing up and as most western music is taught is very it's a very linear exercise so most styles of music we listen to uh most popular styles of music in the west are like in four so you you can count them one two three four or various subdivisions of that so one and two and three and four and um although there are some more complex styles of music and odd signatures, um, you know, in five, seven, etc. And so you spend years learning these to read and write and play these linear patterns. And that's pretty much your entire endeavor is to learn these patterns and they can get more and more complex. Um, they do get more and more complex. Um, but that was the, the entire approach that I took to learning to play for like a good 10 years before I went to Musicians Institute. Going there, I was fortunate enough to meet a teacher. Um, his name was Efren Toro. He was a Latin percussion instructor. And I actually spent many hours with him, like unlearning a lot of what I learned about drums and rhythm previously, because of his big approach or his big discovery was that rhythm as it exists in nature is not linear. So um, when I say linear, I mean like, like normally how we perceive time to be just kind of flowing in a, in a straight line. So um, specifically rhythm as it exists in nature and in natural music in particular, like African, Afro-Cuban, Brazilian, Indian, and even jazz um, is not, when you, when you start to dissect it and get into it and deeper into it, it's not linear. So the discovery for me was that even though we perceive rhythm in a linear way, that natural rhythm is actually multidimensional or it's, um, it's harmonic. So to kind of explore that a little bit, I will, I'm going to hit these drums just for, just for a, a good minute, no, no longer than a minute. So for those of you that <laughs> it's annoying, I, I won't, won't be long. And hopefully it will translate on Zoom. Um, I'm not sure what it will sound like on Zoom. But the most fundamental rhythm that um, exists in nature, and this refers to not just rhythm, but also a melody as well, sound waves. There's a fundamental rhythm, and then there's a doubling of that rhythm, which is a harmonic. And then there's um, another, the next layer top is three times as fast as the first wave. So. What that sounds like in, in, in rhythm, in drumming, is this fundamental rhythm is what's called two, three. It, it's also sometimes referred to as polyrhythm. So 
Um, it could be called two against three. But what it is, is it's two, two pulses occurring simultaneously. And then there are layers of downbeats and upbeats that are built upon that. Um, and this rhythm can be found in all types of natural music in the world from people that never studied anywhere. They just naturally um, express themselves with this style of rhythm. And again, relating that to pitch as well, just like when we, it's very prominent when you hear monks chant, you hear a fundamental pitch and then you'll hear harmonics on top of those pitches. And so it's the same thing with pitch. I won't go too deeply into that because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not as well versed in that, but there is, it's really interesting how there's this relationship between rhythm and, and pitch as well in terms of the, the layers of the harmonics. So, so again, so now I will, I'll show you what two, three sounds like. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this, this pulse and I'm going to count. Um, I'm going to focus on one, one of the pulses first and then the second pulse second. And, and the trick is, and, and what you would do when you practice these things is you're learning how to hear them differently. So it's not just playing it. It's not just counting it, but it's, can you hear it from one perspective and then the other perspective? So first I'll play it for a second because, and then I'll, um, and then I'll count it. Uh, it's okay. All right. Thank you. All right. That's cool. Thanks. So. So very simply, that's the that's this very amount of fundamental rhythm that can be found, obviously in different speeds and different variations in all these styles of music. And just another example of that, the next layer in that rhythm would be four and three. So it's basically a doubling of the two here. So that would be. it up a little bit there but that's it's hard to count and play at the same time but the 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 it's switching back between the two again you would hear this three on one side so you would hear is the that was all the drumming that i'll do today i'm not really a percussionist per se most of my stuff is on a drum set but i just wanted to kind of demonstrate that multi-level rhythm um, so what is so special about that how did it lead to dharma <laughs> what the heck am i talking about here um, <laughs> the first thing um that was really that really hit me in that in sort of that discovery and sort of that learning process was how our senses can kind of deceive us. Um, like I've been studying rhythm and drums for many years, and all of a sudden I'm discovering that there's this whole deeper dimension of it that I didn't know existed. And um, and the 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 thing that really that really hit me that was probably the most profound moment for me was I would sit in the room with Efren for hours. We would be talking about these, these topics and, you know, playing. And at one point, you know, he's talking about how everything is rhythm, you know, sound waves, the, there's lo the light waves we perceive as various colors are different frequencies of, of, of rhythm. Um, and so we're basically, you know, we're sitting here in a vibrating sea of, of atoms. Um, so, you know, I'm just almost like a meditative experience where I'm realizing, you know, everything 
that we're experiencing is some form of rhythm. Um, and I'm like, yeah, okay, this, this makes perfect sense. I got it, everything's rhythm. And then I had a, a moment where my mind, you know, this is all pre-Buddhism, pre-meditation, but I had this moment where my mind became kind of still and then I, I, a thought came up in my mind. I said, I said okay, well then, if everything is rhythm, then, then what is a thought? You know, and I just had this moment where I'm becoming aware of a thought appearing in my mind. And, and it occurred to me that, that that was not rhythm. That was something else and um, something that I wanted to explore more, more deeply. Um, so that, that was kind of the, the, the bridge right there was this, you know, getting really deep into rhythm and becoming, connecting rhythm to nature, connecting rhythm to my experience of the world but then realizing there is something even beyond rhythm that I didn't know about and I'm still obviously working to discover through the Dharma, but that that was, that was kind of the bridge for me. Um, so it was, it was that experience combined with really questioning how I learn, how, how we learn about things, um, the patterns we use, you know, Patterns can be found everywhere. The patterns we use to understand the world, patterns in language. Um, pardon me one second. The patterns about how they, they cause us to think we may understand something when we're only seeing maybe a limited perspective or, or a, like a, a, a layer of that, that meaning. So that, that was kind of my, my experience there. And, it, and at first it was very depressing because <laughs> I felt like, you know, like I, um, you know, I thought I was, I was, you know, I was not a great drummer, but I was decent at what I did. And I put so many hours and years into it. And then, and then you, you just get to that moment where you realize there's, there's just so much more that you were missing. And that was kind of depressing. And I had to sort of, I had this, pardon me one second. At first, it was depressing because I felt like I really had to deconstruct myself quite a bit to to realize some of the things that I had been missing or the things that I had not maybe even misconstrued. And then that then led to a search, a search for a deeper understanding. Uh, that experience, along with those kind of introspective experiences I had playing. Um, so I had a kind of a period of like starting over where I, I began like reading that though that um, the mindset I had earlier on of maybe not being interested in academics suddenly was quite different. I wanted to learn as much as I could about everything, um, spiritually or not, science, whatever. Um, I read the Bible, I read the Bhagavad Gita, um, I dabbled in Rosicrucianism. Um, I read it was, when I started reading books on Buddhism, though, that's when it really, um, things started to click. Like, um, one, of the first, one of the first things that clicked with regard to Buddha Dharma was the notion of samsara. So obviously, samsara is a huge pattern. Um, and there's a lot of little patterns that make up samsara. And obviously, the goal is to break through that pattern. So there was a, there was a pretty glaring um, correlation right there. Um, also dependent origination and how dependent origination relates to karma and emptiness. That was another connection there. Um, and then I'll just continue a little bit more um, with my story about how, how then I became more deeply ingrained or, or began learning more about Buddhism was when I I met uh, Kempo Girmit Trinle Rinpoche, who Dirk knows uh, as well, who was one of our first teachers. Um, I'd read, how I found Kempo was I'd read a few books that mentioned lamas with the last name of Rinpoche. And uh, I saw some, I think it was a flyer or maybe an advertisement that Kempo Girmit Trinle Rinpoche was teaching at Fort Mason in San Francisco. And I remembered wondering if it was like the lama that I'd read in a book, if it was like his brother or something, like there's, these Rinpoche brothers that are out there teaching. And I was like, I was like, 
It's like, well, you must be good. If I, I, I read this book that about this other Rinpoche, so there must be, <laughs> obviously later that I found out that's just a honorific title. Um, <laughs> but it turned out Kempo was an amazing Rinpoche and a great teacher. Um, and he was the first teacher I took refuge with. Um, and I wandered into his teaching on the Prajnaparamita. So that's just a real great uh, first teaching there and dive right into the deep end. Um, and I'll, although I didn't fully understand everything, I'm sure I, I missed a ton, uh, maybe only caught a very small part of it. The things he described about emptiness uh, really blew my mind. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of anything like that at all. The teachings on emptiness immediately kind of gave me a very serene feeling and really settled my mind with regard to some things that had been troubling me for so long. Um, you know, things about existence, non-existence, the universe, the Big Bang, all, all those things kind of, I felt like in that moment really, a lot of things were settled for me and I, I really felt uh, a, great, a great deal of connection with him at that point. Um, but unfortunately, he he was going to travel to India the next week or something. So I actually met Dirk at that teaching. This must have been around 1999, I guess. Um, uh, and I remember that the Kempo was going to travel to India. And so I, I remember, despite this, Dirk was kind enough to invite me to his weekly practice um, that he was doing green Tara practice. And over the course of the next few years, he taught me so many things. Uh, obviously, he's immensely knowledgeable, um, not just about Buddha Dharma, but about so many things. And I was so fortunate to be able to just go sit with him every week and ask. I would be reading books, and I would come in there and just ask him questions. What does this mean? What does that mean? And um, I was so lucky to have him, and I'm eternally grateful for that. And in many ways, he was my first teacher. and he. I still consider him a teacher and obviously a friend. Um, so thank you, Dirk. <laughs> um, and from there, I went to Seichen Ling in San Francisco and began studying with Geshe Ngawan Dakpa. I studied low rig, tenets, uh, the Bodhicharya Vatara. Um, from there, I went on to study with Lama Alan Wallace, Shama the Vipassana, Dream Yoga, Four Applications of Mindfulness, Sogchen. And um, it's kind of interesting how full circle is, again, reconnecting with Dirk and having him introduce me to this wonderful center and amazing Lama and Sangha. So it's really interesting how that connection 20, however many years later, has brought me back here. Um, so that I'm definitely some, some blessings that, that have made that possible. Although it's kind of interesting how it happened right as he moved to Pennsylvania. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know exactly how all that came about, but it's interesting. So to sort of conclude, I, I, I am a little early, I guess, but um, to conclude, um, I, I, I wanted to conclude with some, something relating patterns to, to Dharma. And I was doing some Google searches and I read a quote from um, a Lama named Lama Jampataye, who I don't know, and I don't know his book um so i'm not endorsing his book or or i have no judgment on his book um his book is called patterns and emptiness and I, I thought this quote was was really interesting he said how do buddhist teachings answer the most profound questions of our existence what makes his thinking unique amongst other systems of thought the answer lies in his teachings on dependent origination which hold the key to unlocking the doctrines of karma rebirth suffering liberation and compassion Patterns and emptiness shows how understanding this core Buddhist teaching of dependent origination can transform how we see the world and provide an antidote to the disordered thinking that leaves us in the grip of disruptive emotions. So I thought that was a interesting connection again, relating patterns to the Buddha Dharma and how there are these patterns in the conventional world that we live in that surround us and how seeing through or, or breaking through those patterns can lead us to, to deeper insights. So that's all I had. I have, I did have one other Dharma quote that's not 
totally related to this subject that I could read if there are no questions, but um, if, if anyone would like to ask questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. Go for it. Thank you for your talk, Dan. Thank you. What is your name? My name is Dan. Dan. Yeah. That's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it don't get any harder. <laughs> I wonder if you could um, maybe give a, a, a real world example of a pattern that you perceived after your, um, your uh, revelation um, that was just clear. Um, I can't, um, I don't know if I'll be able to s tell you one pattern in particular, but I will tell you that I began studying computer programming shortly thereafter, and that's nothing but patterns. And I was not, and I'm still not a great mathematician, um, but I am able to see patterns and remember patterns and recognize patterns and um that came in very handy for that pursuit so to this day my job is nothing but pattern recognition <laughs> literally that's what i do so that's that's one example of that but then there's also mental patterns um there's you know we're taught a lot in, in, in Dharma about habitual patterns and tendencies. And so it became a pursuit of trying to recognize patterns in myself. So it relates, it relates to, to everything, patterns, yeah. Um, thank you, Dan, for that. It was very interesting to me. I was thinking that maybe the the idea um, in the way we learn to look at ourselves and be more and more aware of our um, inner life and outer life and the connection, the pattern between them, when you were playing um, on the drums, and how a pattern can seem very complex and very confusing, but when one looks really deeply, you see the, the rhythmic uh, pattern that is there that is very solid and very and I think as we look into our lives some things that may seem very very confusing as we look deeper and learn more we can see that yes they are very regular and and will clear some of the confusion when we recognize that regularity of the the seemingly complex Thing. So someone listening to you doing the drumming that maybe had no musical background, whatever, go, my God, what is that? Right. When it's but then one begins, oh, yeah, this is three, three and this two. is it's four, yeah, and, yeah. and yet it, you know, so I think that can also relate to how we look at the world. Yeah, I totally agree. That's well said. It's a, it's a matter of perspective. It's a, it's a matter of um, more, exactly. Yeah, well said. Go for it. Um, I have a question about the pattern of like what you were talking about, like habitual mental patterns, like and recognize them. Can you can you can you tell me how for you how that helps when you um, when you practice recognizing habitual um, mental patterns, especially like if they're a really strong one that's not very pleasant that come arises. So. So what do you mean exactly like how how you come to recognize them or, or? I think we can recognize I, yeah, I was thinking I about rec recognizing rec them, the but, but then in that recognition then then uh, uh, the, I guess in that recognition uh, then what like yeah yeah then well I think in order to apply the they talk about applying the antidotes a lot you know so um Obviously, if you don't recognize the pattern, then you're not going to try to apply any antidotes and you're going to be sucked into the pattern and, you know, carried away. So for me, like, yeah, recognizing the pattern is sort of the, 
the first step to then be able to hopefully have some freedom to be able to try to apply an antidote or to be able to try to see it from a different perspective um, as opposed to, as I said, getting caught in, in the groups of it and thrown, thrown downstream. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. I, 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 I somehow know this. I just need to hear this, what you just said a lot of times about how the recognition of the pattern is helpful to, to be at the, per, the ability to make a choice arises when we recognize what's happening, the pattern. Yeah, and the more we practice, I notice when I'm not practicing um, that it's harder to, there's less freedom. There's more, you're more kind of thrown around by the pattern. But the more you pr practice and the more awareness you, you obtain of the pattern, the more freedom you then have to make a choice and, and to um, sometimes for me is just to stop and not do anything at all and just wait, <laughs> wait for it to pass and, you know, so, yeah. Hi, Dan. Hi. My name is Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Um, so I was, when you talked about patterns and patterns in nature, it brought to mind something that occurred to me about 15 years ago. And I had broken a pattern of thought and it was just so, and I had no Buddhist background at all, but it happened in a river. <laughs> and I was up at the Yuba River and I was just letting the stream carry me up and going back and forth for probably, a, a, I would say an hour and a half, okay? I had no background in meditation, background in prayer, but not in constant, like meditating, right? Mm -hmm. I never felt clearer. And in, in a sense, it's probably what's brought me here many years later. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one thing that I'm, I'm curious about the role that nature has without the... Uh, you know, in, in breaking other patterns and what you, what your thoughts are on that? Um, that's, that's a very interesting question. But yeah, I think there is something to that because obviously the more, um, the further we are away from nature, the, I mean, I mean, there's something to be said for nature reminding us of what's natural about us. And obviously everything we're doing here is to recognize the nature of mind which is the natural state of our minds. So that's not to say that you can just go in nature and become enlightened, but um, I would say perhaps that environment is more conducive to those insights um, than if you are in the middle of, uh, you know, stop and go traffic in LA or something like, I mean, I mean, that's not to say you can't have insights anywhere, but, um, but yeah, the, there, there was, even for me, the, like I was talking about, the fact that I was connecting this thing that I had been doing that I was so passionate about to all of a sudden to connecting that to nature. That was like the, the real kind of expansive experience for me was, was realizing that I'm not just, um, this isn't like an isolated pursuit. This is connected to something deeper and to something that people all around the world have been doing for thousands of years and that are not part of this modern culture and that um, and that there's something very fundamental and natural that they all share in common even though they've never maybe never um, encountered each other these different styles of music these, this this very same natural pattern was occurring throughout the world uh, over time so I'm like okay there's something very magical about that pattern to me so Uh, are there, you may have said this before, are there different types of music which are more related to the way things work in nature where everything's interrelated as opposed to linear where you're thinking or everything's just going in a straight line? E yes. <laughs> I mean, um, but that's not to say that there's anything wrong or bad about linear. Um, linear is just... Um, 
it's just linear. It's it's not. It's, I mean, most most of the modern pop music, classical music, is more rhythmically linear. Now, harmonically, it, that's another discussion. But when it, in terms of rhythm, the 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 styles of music where the like these patterns can be found is um, African music, Brazilian music, um, Cuban, Indian, and uh, jazz here in the, uh, our native music that, was, that came out of the US is jazz. It's definitely found there as well. Um, so that that is where you'll you'll find you'll hear that. I mean, put on any Afro-Cuban music, you'll immediately if you listen for a little bit, you'll begin to hear that that pattern. Variations of it. There may be six and four, but those that that fundamental multi-dimensional pulse you'll hear it's not a, a it's not a a static straight line of, of things so hearing something that some music goes to a conclusion and others doesn't <laughs> that's <laughs> well yeah there's a big difference also between improvisational music and and not so but yeah thank you does anyone online have any questions Zima. It's funny that you mentioned traffic because after I watched a speech given by uh, the Dalai Lama, I realized that um, I'm a seriously bad driver to begin with. And I realized that no one was out to get me. <laughs> they, they didn't even know I was there driving. I drive a lot on five. So um, I after I like kind of, I, after I dropped the personality part, it all became rhythmic so that it was like, okay, this is happening. This is happening. Where will, how do I fit in? I need to get here. I want to go there. And it just became really rhythmic. Mm -hmm. So it's so much easier to drive. <laughs> Interesting. I don't know. I don't know. I, for me, that was a reflection of mind only. Um, school <laughs> what was going on in my mind I could be more rhythmic um with dropping the actuality of dealing dealing with people in what some you, ways <laughs> yeah what you just described made me think of another example of being in rhythm and that is sports teams so you'll see a basketball team that that is not in rhythm, they're not in sync and things aren't going well for them. And then they'll, you'll hear them describe it. All of a sudden they got into a flow or they got into a rhythm and it's not anything they can tangibly describe or say how it happened, but somehow they got in rhythm, they got in the zone and then things started flowing and, and they started obviously doing better. So yeah, that's, a, that's interesting, the, seeing the rhythm, yeah. It's funny. It's interesting. I, I grew up, my mom's very musical. So we always had music in the house. So when I think of music, I think of, um, I think the, of the rhythm of my body, which is a lot faster than most music. My body moves really fast. My mind moves really fast. So I've gotten to the point where I'm down to sound, there are sounds, nature sounds and unnatural sounds that really intrigue me. A lot of them are rhythmic too. Um, and on a body level, I like those rhythms. Driving, not so much, but on a body level, I like those sounds. So I find that intriguing also. <laughs> Interesting. I, I'm, I'm similar in terms of sounds. Like I, um, Sometimes my wife, is, I drive her a little crazy. I'm like, what's that sound? I'm like, always listening to sounds. And I have to, I have to know what every sound is and go figure out where it came from. And so I'm really, I'm really in tune with sounds. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, that, that's probably enough about that. But that I need to talk to you about this. <laughs> Anytime. Let me know. Matthew. So this is really begging a question for me. Okay. Do you... Do you find that the path is a rhythm? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. 
Um, and I don't know if I have a good answer. <laughs> I think it's, I don't know if I'd say it's a rhythm, but um, there, are definitely, there are definitely patterns that, um, depending on what type of teaching, obviously there's a lot of the, the lists, you know, the four this, the 10 that, the seven this, the, the, those are, to me, those are patterns that are trying to give you insight into something that's beyond like the finger pointing at the moon, you know, they're trying to get you to realize something deeper. But um, yeah, that's a good question, though. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> no, I really like the, the patterns yeah. in place of rhythm. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Dirk, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> yep, it's time for the big trouble. I apologize. Uh -oh. I have an alarm going off because I'm got bread rising, but um, and I didn't want to leave to take care of it. Uh, I was looking forward to your talk. You know, 45 years ago, I was lying. I was living in my car in Southern California in the rainy season, and I would lie in my lie in the back seat at night when I was ready to go to sleep and try to hear patterns in the rhythm of the rain. And uh, I was trying to hear, I was trying to hear, pick out specific types of patterns like ancient Greek poetic rhythms and stuff like that. And I was never able to do it, but what I, what I, what I did kind of re realize in a way is that not all rhythm is pattern or not all rhythm is a repeating pattern. That that there's uh, that that my mind has this rhythm that that I can't conceptualize at all. So, what, do you have uh, anything to say about that? <laughs> well, that's that's part of what's um, interesting about. So, the two three thing that I did was just just the most basic rhythm. But the the idea is that yeah, the rhythm rhythm can be chaotic, a little bit chaotic, like you said, maybe not always repeating or not. Um, perceptively repeating like it's um, it's a lot of things happening at once it's harmonic just like the harmonics of the monks chant it's it's not uh, linear so um, you know nature can be messy <laughs> nature can be not clean and tidy like we want to perceive it so um, yeah that's I don't know if that answers or answer your question or but that yeah <laughs> so i know what you mean though about listening for patterns and and sometimes they um especially with the mind it can be just expressive and not necessarily some repeatable observable pattern that that is easily defined or easily perceived Andrew. Hey there, Dan. Uh, really interesting talk. Um, I was thinking about with rhythm and pattern and drumming, there's something that we don't immediately think about, which is the silence between the beat. Um, and so I kind of wanted to hear some of your thoughts on kind of how does that relate to the Dharma? Oh, how it relates to the how it relates to the Dharma is harder. I was going to answer, yeah, the the <laughs> yeah, because there is no pulse without the space, right? Because if it's if, otherwise, it's just one disturbance, one sound wave, one one sound. You know, that's not a rhythm. That's not a a pulse. It's not a pattern. So yeah, there has to be some spatial relationship between each sound to produce a rhythm. Now, how that relates to the Dharma. It's another good question. How you think of it, <laughs> the answer, but it just feels like there's something really important about the silence. It's it's the it's like when we're thinking about um, our monkey minds and the the seeming chaos of life, and we're not paying attention to the silence between the thoughts and things like that. I'm just wondering what you think. Yes, definitely, and I can. This isn't exactly what you're 
talking about, but I can say also when you're playing an instrument that there, the monkey mind is very detrimental to playing an instrument. And mm -hmm. so <laughs> it, it, you, you, in order to really get in the flow and express that part of the mind has to kind of go a bit silent. Um, and it has, you have to be more in like an awareness mode. So that was, that's actually another connection between playing music and getting into Dharma and meditation. There was kind of a, a definite thread there that like, um, that silence is very important. And, and, and particularly even playing really heavy, loud, fast styles of music, which it seems like a contradiction like that, that would be very um, disruptive or uh, mentally disturbing, but actually in, in, in those styles of music as well, the, the more calm, the more, more space in the mind, the more um, expressive and the more accurately you can express those styles of music as well. Um, so, I don't Did you ever play um, the one drop, like the, the reggae rhythm? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, I know what I know what reggae rhythms are. Yeah, um, I'm not like, sure. It's what... like a syncopated, like, like you can have your standard beat, and then it adds it like it's adds something by subtracting. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh yeah, and yeah. it makes you think about the pause before the beat, if that makes sense. There, there is a lot of in terms of well, that's a whole nother subject in terms of drums, like is groove, which is like you can have two drummers play the exact same thing and have it sound totally different, have a total different feel to it. And that is all to do with very subtle variations in, in timing and space. And, and so like, um, yeah, groove is a, and in fact, to this day, it's something I'm, I still work on is trying to find groove because that um, nobody can sit down and teach you how to groove. Like that's something you gotta work out and feel um, you know, you can play the notes, but it may not have that feel without, um, without that lies you're describing space there. Space is a big part of it, like very subtle differences in space. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Ellen. Yeah. Thanks. I just can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I just kind of wanted to follow up on that because I was reflecting on Andrew's question in your discussion about the space and it's almost like as Westerners anyway, and I don't know if they do this all over the world, we treat the space as less valuable than the non-space. You know, and I think of a lot of the discoveries that have been made lately on the nature of matter, you know, and there's a whole lot more space or even emptiness as it pertains to our aggregates and such there's a whole bunch more space than there is actual non-space and it seems like you know my training traditionally just in society is that space is worthless you know and it's the it's the non-space that's really of value but then you know the way you described it is like you wouldn't have the music without the non-space so it seems like it's almost equally as valuable and maybe even more valuable. I don't know. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I totally, um, I totally agree. Uh, and I agree with what you described about space um, seeming worthless or like it's nothing. But I think even, I'm not a physicist by any means, but I think even physics are discovering that space, just space itself is full of all kinds of stuff. There's not, even space isn't, devoid of anything, right? Um, you, you can probably correct me if I'm wrong on that, but, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, thanks. It's, I mean, and I liken it to also conversations, like sometimes the best conversations, the best thing you can do in a conversation is not respond, at least not respond right away, you know, and just give the person that space and hear them. So that it's really fascinating what you said. I think about the rhythm and the space. So excellent talk. I enjoyed it very much and got a lot out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or shall we wrap? We got one last one. The 
this will be quick. Have okay. you done the refuge ceremony thing? Yes. You have? Yes. With Lama Jimpa, yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that it? Announcements? Okay. Yes. Okay. So we'll do prayer, closing prayers, and then um, actually, can I read one last quote real quick? Uh, this, this, <laughs> okay. This is just a, a this is a, a, it doesn't ex exactly relate to what we've talked about, but it's about the, the eight worldly concerns. Um, so I just, I just think it's a really interesting story from, from this book, Tibetan Buddhism from the ground up. Um, and it's about practicing Dharma. <laughs> cultivating the mind is very much like cultivating a crop. A farmer must know the proper way to prepare the soil so the seed, actually, this is not right, forgive me. It's, uh... All right, let's focus now on other rituals that are widely regarded as spiritual practices or Dharma, meditation, prayer, yoga, and so on. As we engage in such actions, it is essential to repeatedly ask ourselves, are these practices motivated by the eight worldly concerns? This point is well illustrated by a well-known Tibetan story. A man living about a thousand years ago felt dissatisfied with his life, so he decided to practice Dharma. Tibetans on the whole are a very pious, devout people, and so it was quite natural for him to apply himself to a devotional practice. A common Tibetan custom is to chant mantras or prayers while walking around a reliquary, counting the mantras with a rosary held in the left hand and rotating a prayer wheel on the right. While our devotee was doing this, a sage named Drontopa noted his behavior and commented to him, it is very good to circumambulate a reliquary, but it is even better to practice Dharma. We can imagine this fellow being a bit ruffled at the teacher's remark, for he clearly thought he was practicing Dharma. But then he may have thought to himself, a simple act of piety is apparently not enough. I better practice Dharma by studying the scriptures. Later on, while he was pushing or pursuing this new ritual, Drom Tompa came upon him and remarked, it is very good to read the scriptures, but it is even better to practice Dharma. Knowing that such studies were a commonly respected practice in Tibet, our seeker was probably more perplexed than ever. But he gave the matter further thought and he came upon the bright idea that he hoped would resolve the problem. Meditate. Clearly, many Buddhist sages assert that meditation is the essence of Dharma. So here was a sure track. But when Drom Tompa saw meditating, he gently rebuked him, saying, it is very good to meditate, but it is even, it is even better to practice Dharma. At this point, our devotee turned scholar turned meditator felt exasperated. What were his options now? What did this renowned teacher have in mind? So finally he asked him and the teacher replied, give up attachment to this life and let your mind become Dharma. So I really like that story, so. <laughs> Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Rajapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. O Sangdrapa, I make requests at your holy feet. I, I know I speak for everyone when I say thank you so much, Dan. I just loved your talk so much. I could see on everyone's questions how many of us were so curious about what you were speaking to. So thank you, and I can't wait for you to come again and teach. <laughs> so um, Thank you. I have a, an announcement, and then I'm going to... Um, ask uh, JD this time to give an announcement, but um, we had just started this uh, book giveaway. There's a table back here and it's organized by Doug and Sue. And so 
we, if you have books at home that you're not reading, we could share them with each other and it's free. You take one, give one, kind of like that. If you don't have one to give, just take one. And uh, so they're in the back and there's, um, we've just started so we don't have too many books yet, but we will. And then uh, next Friday is Expressions, which is our uh, amazing, oh, I just went last time and that was so amazing with a Japanese dancer, a harp player from France. Um, and then uh, Andrew Castro, our own uh, an acoustic guitar player and, and then poets and it's just like, and we get front row seats, we're really close. And that, on top of it, it benefits Middle Way Health Foundation to help people who without our help won't be have, have someone to talk to provides free psychotherapy to people in our community. So that's connected with expressions. And I'm gonna give the microphone to JD. I'll be singing a little number. I just wanted to say th um, thanks also. And um, as Patty said earlier today, um, we don't pass a basket because, um, you know, like if you can give, that's great. And if you can't, there are so many other ways to give. So it's not like we don't wanna get to call attention to how people are giving. But if you get, um, we are requesting small, I mean, a donation in any amount is helpful. There are a lot of bills to pay, you know, lights to keep on, we get food, we have expressions, we do so many different things. And uh, a contribution in any amount is greatly appreciated. So that's my pitch. Oh, thank you. Well, the one thing I forgot is that if I forget something, I'm hoping people here will help me. But the other uh, really amazing thing is that at Run to Feed the Hungry, which is like I heard one time that it's the biggest uh, um, uh, run in the United States. Is this true? Did I hear that right? But it's very large no matter what. And we have uh, Elizabeth Zima is organizing us so that um, we can walk or run and contribute to uh, the cause of feeding our neighbors people uh, there's a lot of need out there and things are so expensive with gas and food prices oh my gosh so if you want to join uh, elizabeth um she's uh well her contact information is in the roar but you can also um shoot an email to info at lions and we'll connect you with elizabeth okay so thank you and anyone else have an announcement that i may have forgotten oh the movie Could, would you uh well is it too much okay so I guess there's so many announcements I could go on and on and that's too much for all of you. So please check out the roar and sign up if you haven't already because then you can you don't have to listen to me you can just see it for yourself. So thank you.